banks have wise old saying too. You don't lend O'Rourke the money, he loses his saloon and stops buying whiskey from you and you walk around with holes in your moccasins. F Troops, Larry Storage, today on Pop Goes the Culture. Hi, I'm David Levin and welcome to another debatable episode of Pop Goes the Culture. Larry Storch is 94 years old and still going strong. Growing up in the Bronx, Storch began as a stand-up comedian and impressionist and eventually becoming a frequent and favorite guest star on loads of TV shows in the 50s and 60s and 70s, including Car 54, Where Are You?, Sergeant Bilko, Get Smart, The Flying Nun, The Alfred Hitchcock Hour, That Girl, I Dream of Jeannie, Gomer Pyle, Gilligan's Island, All in the Family, The Love Boat, but he's best known as Corporal Randolph Agorn on F Troop, which ran on ABC for two seasons from 1965 to 1967, but still 65 episodes in all. To the kids who grew up in the 60s, Storch also voiced many of our favorite cartoons, most notably the character Mr. Whoopi on the series Tennessee Tuxedo, which also starred the great Don Adams. Now, Storch's definitely a product of his time, another era, with kind of a dated sense of humor and definitely on PC, but he's part of showbiz history, beloved by his fans, so I'm sharing this interview, warts and all, unedited. Make of it what you will. Frequently funny, sometimes not so much, but always like those of his cohort out there pitching. In part one of my conversation with Larry Storch, we'll talk about how he got on to F Troop, his friendship with Boris Tucker, the real reason why Ken Berry never kissed back Wrangler Jane, a bunch of the greatest impressions, including his cartoon voices. But we started out talking about one of his favorite F Troop guests, Paul Lind. Paul Lind was a guest on, and I do a Paul Lind impersonation. So, uh, you know, we can talk about Paul Lind. What was he like? Paul Lind was the greatest. I, I did him in my act. He, he, he knocked me out. I couldn't get enough of him. He was a funny guy. Yeah. Would, would he do stuff off screen or was it mostly just, I mean, he was great certainly on screen. What was he like off, off camera? He wasn't much different off screen. He was that same cynical uh, kind of, are we on now? Yeah, we're rolling. <clears throat> He was cynical. He was very cynical. For example, the, uh, the, the shot to outer space, which didn't work yesterday, he would have had, uh, he had something, he said, um, the doctors at NASA are training a lady astronaut whose frequent trips into outer space have affected her sex life. She can only have sex. The magnetic pull of the moon through the, by the magnetic pull of the moon, when the tide comes in, or when her husband goes out. <laughs> he was one of the, he was something like that, you know. And, and I loved him, under sedation. <laughs> what was it, what, how did you get involved with F Troop? How did that happen? Was it... All by accident. Uh, a fellow named Paul Benson, publicity. He said, Larry, there's a show going on I think it's called uh, F Troop. F Troop. Go on down and, and, and look at it and see what you think. I was desperate to get into anything, any kind of vehicle to be on TV. And so uh, I went down to, uh, to the studio to uh, audition for F Troop. And when I got there, Forrest Tucker, all six feet five of them, standing there putting on the sergeant's uniform, and uh, he said, you know, we may be able to work together. He's got the sergeant's role, but he said, I'll probably need a corporal. You could be corporal, whatever. And Forrest Tucker, who was very generous, was instrumental in getting me the role of the Corporal Agarn on F Troop. Pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, what was it like when, when you guys start? I mean, F Troop was clearly a very different type of situation comedy. Yes. You know, set in the past, set right. in, you know, with the Old West. There was there was really not a whole lot of stuff like that. And it had a ridiculous sense of humor that was just really absurd and funny. Who was responsible for that? Even in the very beginning, Seaman, Seaman Jacobs, Frank Jacobs and Seaman, oh gosh, Frank, I forget their names now, but anyway, <clears throat> they had the idea where we were a, a troop that was that really never measured up to the army standards, and we were th considered third-class soldiers, horsemen, horse soldiers were, and uh, they were. 
and he figured out, they figured out, if we had a, a deal, with a money-making deal with an Indian tribe, they, it was a way to uh, inject more humor because the Indians were funny and we dealing with the Indians was really quite, uh, quite different and quite funny. And for the fact that the Indians were afraid of the dark, you know, they would be, the Hakawi tribe would never attack after dark. We afraid, we lovers, we not fighters, we Hakawi, we lovers, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and the chief, Frank Dukova, he was an Italian fellow, but he mo looked more like an Indian with feathers on than any Indian you ever saw. And so he was perfect. <laughs> um, when you guys were, were playing stuff out, I mean, the, the, obviously a lot was there on, on, in the script. Some shows, there's a little bit of improvisation, you know, people sort of deviate from the script. Other shows, script all the way along. So what was it like on your set? If we wanted to add anything, we did it before the, before the shot before the shot. Uh, once the, the dialogue was in, once we were doing the scene, we did the scene the way it was written. But we did up improvisation before the, before the scene. What kind of stuff did you, did you get to contribute um, in terms of creatively? When, you know, when you're coming up with the humor, you're coming up with funny little bits, what kind of stuff do you remember that, uh, that you... That you that well, there was one scene where we, we brewed our own whiskey and at the end, very end of the show, the whole set blew up. And I said, I want to be hanging from a tree. Not on the ground. I want to be hanging upside down from a tree. And the punchline was, I knew it had a kick, Sarge. But whoever dreamed, you know. And we, we figured that one out before the shot. So we did a lot of improvisation before the, uh, before the action. Action! We did all of our thinking up in front. How much fun was it playing with uh, Forrest Tucker? He was the most generous guy you ever met in your life. If a line sounded funnier coming from you, he would tell the director, listen, they let the Indian chief have it, or let uh, the crazy cat have it, or let uh, the captain have it. You know, he was very generous in that respect. And uh, he wanted to be funny. He all, he, inside of him, he wanted to be funny, and he did turn out to be quite a, quite a good comedian. He had been very, he'd done a lot of serious roles and heavy roles. Oh, indeed he did. What kind of roles did Forrest Tucker, what did you know about Forrest Tucker before you met him? Did you first meet him at the, at the um, audition? I met him first at the audition, yes. And I'd known that he, he could be a dramatic actor. He was with John Wayne. John Wayne was quite fond of him and use him quite a bit in, in his westerns. And he was an action actor and a great horseman, a great horseman. How about some of the other, your other co-stars on the show? There was Bob Steele, first of all. We mustn't forget him. He was probably, and even Forrest Tucker and everybody said he, he was the best horseman in all of Hollywood, Bob Steele. Best cowboy there was. Uh, the captain was Ken Berry. He could steal any scene he put his mind to, and he didn't do it overtly. He did it just kind of mumbling and fumbling about. And, uh, and he could walk away with any scene. But I loved him for it, and we all did. I, I loved being in scenes with, with Ken Berry. And let me see, the, uh, who else was there? Lady Patterson? Oh, wasn't she darling? She was only 15 when she showed up on the set, and she looked like, like Ginger Rogers, you know. My God, we thought she was 23 or 24. No, she was 15. And when word passed around us, sh boys, hey, watch your language, come on, hey. She's only 15 years old, you know, hey, come on. So we, uh, we, had, to, <laughs> we had to watch our, it was tough. They said no four letter words, you know, hey. So we, we, we watched ourselves. I heard that um, because she was so young that at first, the way they realized, you know, they didn't want to change the casting, but they had to change how they approached the romantic scenes. Do you, do you remember that? They approached her, but Her romantic scenes with, with, with the captain. 
Do you mm -hmm. remember that? At, at first, they could, he could, he wouldn't ever kiss back. He never kissed back in any of the scenes. No, I never remember Captain Captain Parman ever kissing Wrangler Jane on the lips. She hang she hung on to him, and he would say, "Janey, please, not in front of the men." You know, he he kind of backed off. And we had some great guests. We said, we had Milton Berle and Phil Harris. I remember Phil Harris came to the set one day. He played Chief Flaming Arrow, the oldest Indian uh, on the North American continent. But in person, he was a very ebullient guy. He came on and he said, hey, I want, how many Texans does it take to change a light bulb? You give up? We said, yeah. He said, none. A real Texan ain't scared of the dark. You know, so he was loaded with jokes like that, and it was a joy being with Phil Harris. Uh, the other guest I enjoyed was a fellow you're not familiar with. His, we should be. His name was uh, Fox. What was his first name? My, Bernard Fox. Bernard Fox, of course. And he had a wonderful thing. He said, peace in the world today is going to be very difficult to find, very difficult to find peace in the world today. I mean, when you think of it, uh, America is in, uh, is in uh, Iraq, uh, Russia is in Chechnya, China is in Tibet, God knows where Afghanistan is. I mean, there's nobody home. <laughs> yeah, that, that sort of sense of humor, you see. And, uh, and I cultivated him. I, I liked Bernard Fox very much. He was funny. He did a lot of other shows. Oh, indeed, he did. All these guys, you know, it seemed during the '60s there was a terrific um, pool of great character actors who made the rounds to the different sitcoms. The Portland Thunder. <coughs> I remember we had Edward Everett Horton on the show. He was a, a, a chief, a, a roaring chicken. Oh my word! Oh, oh, oh dear! And I couldn't get enough of him because. I enjoyed him so much with Fred Astaire and, and Ginger Rogers and all of those old Metro go, oh, oh dear. <laughs> and uh, he had a, a throat condition one time, so I, I did the, his lines. <clears throat> and when he saw it, he said, I, that's me, isn't it? Oh, my word, he said, I never sounded better. <laughs> and we, I didn't have the nerve to tell him, that's not you, it's me. You've done a lot of cartoon voices, haven't you? Indeed, I did. Tell me some of the cartoons you did. <clears throat> it's just amazing. What well, there was Frank Morgan. Do you remember Frank Morgan? He was, uh, he was in The Wizard of Oz. He did a lot of other things, but he was famous for the, he was the wizard. And he said to Judy, she said, oh, you're a bad man. He said, no, I'm actually a good man. I'm just a lousy wizard. <laughs> oh, my word. So I did a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of cartoon voices. You did Mr. So that was you, you turned that into Mr. Whoopi, didn't you? Yes, that's right. Uh, tell me about Mr. how you got the Mr. Whoopi thing. What was it like playing with that? I auditioned for that one, and uh, I didn't tell them who I was doing. I just did it, and they said that's fine. He sounds like uh, like a colorful voice, a lot of uh, life. We'll use you for for that. I never told them who I was doing. <laughs> Can I tell you this one? Please. I did uh, well in the family. And I used to do as a joke, and I finally said to Archie Bunker, to uh, Carol O'Connor, this is a joke I'm using. I want your permission to use it because I'm going to do you on the night. Go, go ahead, show me the joke. And I said, Archie Bunker walks into a Chinese antique shop on the Lower East Side, walked over to the Chinese gentleman behind the counter and said, hey, you, Fu Manchu, come over here. I breezed in here 20 minutes ago, and I bought a fan out of you for a quarter. I took the fan outside, I give it a couple of fans, and look at that fan. You remember that? So the Chinese gentleman says, I remember the fan. He said, but I no remember you. He said, all white men look alike. Archie said, don't give me that heartache. You take it from me with me. You ought to joke and write your business with. Here's a fan. There's the quarter. On one side of the quarter, it says, in God we trust. And we all know that God is a male, white, Caucasian. You know, you guys, you're great at building walls. It lasts for 2,000 years. 
How come you can't put a fan together last 20 minutes? Japanese men say, let me see how you find yourself. Archie Bunker said, well, what the heck? For, there ain't no trick to that. I took it outside, I gave it a couple of them things, and look at that fan. Little Chinese man say, for 25 cents, you no fan like that, you fan like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Archie Bunker said, yeah, you, you do it just that way, and uh, you have my permission, you can do it. That's all we have time for today. Next time, my three-part interview with Larry Storch continues. He talks about his work in 1950s TV, Joe E. Ross, the truth about Jackie Gleason backstage, being in the Navy with Tony Curtis, working with Rock Hudson, and of course, his appearances on Car 54, Where Are You? We'll see you then. In the meantime, I'm David Levin, and you can follow Pop Goes the Culture on Twitter at Pop Go Culture, Facebook, or email me at popgoesaculturetv at gmail.com. And please, don't forget to subscribe and share us with your friends.